Wow, I feel like I'm way up here. <laughs> you guys are way back there. But uh, thank you so much for having me here today. It's such an honor and a privilege to be able to address. Um, I've been following you guys on, uh, on Facebook, and it's just amazing and incredible what you're doing here. I can't think of anything better than being in a room full of people who are uh, successful, uh, motivated, and uh, want to fellowship and be with each other and more than anything, want to be with Jesus. I just think that's the most amazing thing in the world. So thank you for having me here. I have to admit, uh, when Sherry first asked me to speak, um, my first thought was, Lord, I don't think you must have mistaken me for someone else. Because first of all, I don't consider myself a professional speaker. And uh, although... I would say that most of my primary school report cards do say talks too much on them. So I probably do have a gift of gab. Um, thank you. Awesome. I'm not an ordained minister. I'm not an evangelist or a comedian. Uh, but I have been known to preach to my kids from time to time. And I'm definitely not a best-selling author. And truthfully, I'm way behind Sherry on my podcast right now and on my blog. Um, but that's... I was kind of ranting with the Lord about that, and that's when he stopped me right in the middle of my rant, and he said, do you really think this is about you? I mean, I may have answered out loud right in the middle of Target when I said, um, okay, Lord, no, it's, it's not. And he said, okay, it's not about you. And then I continued ranting. But the truth is, I just consider myself to be an ordinary person doing ordinary, everyday life, and that's... Uh, that's when sometimes things happen. Like I opened my Facebook and there was a post from Lisa Turkhurst, who is one of my favorite Bible study uh, speakers. And the post said, God can use everyday, ordinary men and women just like you and me to accomplish extraordinary things in his name. And then that's when it hit me. It's about his name and it's about him. And it was never about me. So I'm not here today for me, and I think sometimes, you know, we have to realize that when God calls us to something, that it's not about us. And so I'm here today hoping that there's someone in this room that I've been praying for you for several weeks. Since the beginning of planning to be here, I've been praying for you that God would put the people in this room today that are supposed to be here and I hope that this message will resonate with you. So, <clears throat> I have a question for you. And guys, this is for you too, not just, not just women, but how much time did you spend getting ready this morning? How much time did you spend trying to figure out what you were going to wear? Some of you might have been that person that you planned it all out last night. You had it all organized, you had the perfect outfit with accessories ready to <clears throat> get up and put on this morning. Some of you may have worn a uniform and you knew what you were going to wear because you wear the same thing every day and that's okay. Or maybe you could be the next candidate for an episode of What Not to Wear. In case you're not familiar with that show, that's where they tell people what they're doing wrong with their wardrobe and how to fix it. But I'll admit, I'm at that stage in my life right now where my earthly wardrobe is less about what's fashionable and more about what's functional. <laughs> and uh, in any case, almost everyone has that one outfit that makes them feel confident and put together. And the world calls it a power suit. You know, it's that one that when you put it on, you feel invincible. You feel like you could go out and sell a million houses in that outfit and talk to a million clients. And in the business world, we call it dressing for success. But the bigger question today is, how put together are you when it comes to your spiritual wardrobe? When trouble comes your way, do you find yourself staring at your spiritual closet and it's filled with a divine wardrobe exclusively, exclusively created just for you, but you have no idea how to wear it? Or maybe somewhere along the way you've shoved your spiritual wardrobe into the back of the closet and you don't even know where it is. Or worse, Maybe you've given it away completely and you've replaced it because you thought it was out of style or maybe it just didn't fit you anymore. Well, friends, I've been there. I've been there face down in the middle of my bathroom floor 
in a puddle of tears. You might call it a hot mess. <laughs> Crying out to the Lord, help me. When my spiritual power suit was scattered all over the floor around me, and all I had to do was pick it up and put it on, but I didn't even know where to start. That's when I realized I needed a spiritual wardrobe makeover. And the person to do that was the Apostle Paul. Fashion trends come and go, but the advice that Paul gives us in the book of Ephesians is timeless. Our power suit is none other than the armor of God, and it never goes out of style. And the best part about it is one size fits all. But before we can talk about how to wear our spiritual power suit, we have to understand and acknowledge something, and that is that there is a struggle, and the struggle is real, and there is an enemy, and the enemy is real. And we don't always choose the struggle. Sometimes the struggle chooses us. Some struggles are small, like the coffee machine that was jammed when you got to work today or the barista at Starbucks that left the espresso out of your coffee. And some struggles are bigger, like a delayed closing on a house, or a deal that fell through, or a difficult client that you just can't seem to work with. But some struggles are huge. They are life-changing, earth-shattering, spiritual battles that rock our world and turn things upside down and inside out, and they test our faith. Sooner or later, we'll all face a battle and the enemy who is real. And he wants nothing more than to take us out. Make no mistake. He wants to take you out of the family, out of the workplace, out of the church, out of the deal, and out of the purpose for which God has created you. His main goal is to steal, kill, and destroy. We can't always see this enemy that's camped out around our door each day, but he is there, and we must suit up every single day in the spiritual wardrobe that God has given us, the armor of God. Friends, it's not an earthly battle, and we can't fight it with earthly weapons. Ephesians 6, 10 through 11 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And... Uh, this word wiles was intriguing to me because basically what it means is that the enemy wants to trick us. He uses schemes and disguises to catch us off guard without our armor. And he is a master of propaganda and an illusionist and the father of lies. Deception is his trademark. He loves to tell you, you're not smart enough for this job. You're not good enough. You're not talented enough. You'll never make it. But Satan is not equal to God, and his power is limited, and he is running out of time. Think of a person right now, and don't say it out loud, but think of a person or a situation in your life right now that is giving you grief, something that is hard to deal with. And I just want you to keep that thought in your mind for a moment. Paul tells us in Ephesians 6 through 12, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. So back to that person or situation you just thought about in your head. That person is not the real problem. That situation is not the real problem. Satan is the real problem. 1 Peter 5.8 tells us to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion walking about, seeking whom he may devour. But wait, you don't have to be afraid. We don't need to go peeking around behind every bush looking for that enemy because God has given us exactly what we need to fight our battles. We have a power suit. And that suit didn't just come from God. That suit actually belongs to God. He wears it. And if it's good enough for him to wear, it's good enough for me to wear. And he has gifted it to us through Jesus Christ, his son. 
So at the end of that scripture in Ephesians 6, 13, it says, having done all to stand. And stand to me means don't back down, don't give up, don't give in, don't retreat, and don't ever surrender to the enemy. Maybe you're fighting a battle today. Maybe it's something to do with your job. Maybe it's you're fighting for your children. Maybe you're fighting for your marriage. Maybe you're just fighting for your joy. Whatever it is, stand. Do not accept defeat. Do not retreat. And get up and get dressed and put on your power suit. So how do we wear it? Paul gives us a beautiful metaphor of the Roman soldier's armor to show us exactly how to defend ourselves against attacks. And you know, Paul might just know a little bit about that uh, armor because he spent many years writing this very passage from a jail cell where he probably got to watch that Roman arm, that Roman soldier walk past him time and time again with that armor. So he had a great visual right in front of him and he used it to teach us how to wear the armor the whole armor, with accessories. We can't just pick and choose the parts we like. We can't just decide, oh, I'm going to wear the helmet, but not the belt. Or I'm going to wear the shoes, but I'm not going to pick up the shield. Because every single piece of armor is dependent on the other pieces to be effective. Just like we as the body of Christ are dependent on each other to be effective. And just like most of us have an order on how we get dressed every day and put on our clothes, there is also an order for how to wear this armor. Starting with the belt of truth. And I'm going to tell you, I could spend 30 minutes or longer maybe <laughs> on every one of these pieces of armor. And because time is, you know, a factor today, I will try to give you like the most important things that stand out to me and, and, and that are relevant to me. But I think it's interesting that we put on the truth first. We have to stop believing the lies of the enemy, and we have to believe what God says about us. We have to believe what his word says about us, and we have to start with the truth. That's where everything else starts. The belt of truth holds up all of the other pieces of the armor. It strengthens our core. It's around the center of the soldier, and it strengthens his core, our core, which is our values and our integrity, which you use every day when you go out into the business world to, to, to talk and meet with people. Your integrity is what makes people trust you and want to work with you. It keeps our armor in alignment. It keeps our values aligned with the Word of God and what He says we should do. And when we wrap ourselves in the truth of God, we are wrapping ourselves really in Jesus, who is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. It stabilizes us. It allows us to stand firm. And my favorite part about the belt of truth <laughs> is the soldiers wore tunics. They, they didn't wear combat clothes like they have today. They wore tunics, and they were long dressed like things. And there were times when they had to run right into the battle. And I don't know if you've ever worn a tunic. Most of you guys haven't. But girls understand what it's like to have on a long skirt, and it's getting in the way. And the great thing about this belt of truth is it allowed the soldier to pick up his tunic and tuck it in so that he could run into battle. Otherwise, he would get tripped up and tangled up, and he would serve no purpose. And it allowed him to have a freedom of movement. And I think about that in a spiritual context, and I think about what's tripping me up every day? What's tripping you up every day in your daily walk? Is it stress? Is it conflict? Is it deadlines? Is it distractions? Is it people? Whatever it is, maybe you're getting tripped up because you don't have your tunic tucked in your belt of truth. Have you ever found yourself tangled up into something you shouldn't have been in the first place? I know, for example, sometimes we don't intend to get tangled up in things, but we just do, like um, things that maybe test our integrity, things like gossip, like water cooler talk, like a bad business deal, like a bad relationship. Sometimes we make decisions that question our integrity. So when you look at the belt of truth, it should guide our, our daily principles of who we are and what we do. 
John 8, 31, 32 said, So he said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus is the belt of truth. So how do we wear it? We study God's word. We align every decision that we make and every thing that we say to his word. We filter all of our responses and replies to people through his word. And we get to know Jesus because when we know Jesus, we know the truth. The breastplate of righteousness. This one is a little different than the other pieces because before you can put this particular garment on, you have to take off something. You have to take off something. We have to take off our own sinful garments, our own filthy rags of self-righteousness, of pride, of arrogance, of who we think we are. And we have to lay that aside and we have to put on the righteousness of God. We don't have righteousness within ourselves. Only through salvation and what Jesus did for us on the cross do we have the righteousness of God. I always think back to, and maybe this is like dating me, but there used to be a show on several years ago, and I think they still rerun it, What Not to Wear. And the, the whole purpose of it is they go out and they find somebody who looks awful, awful and dreadful in their clothing, and they try to make them over. But I noticed in this show, before they would put the brand new clothing on them and make them look all awesome and wow, they would force them to go through their own closet and throw out all of the other garments that were not so great. And it was a very emotional time in the show. Some people were so attached to these clothes that they would cry. I've had that sweater since 19, you know, 82. Please don't throw it away. And I thought, aren't we just like that? When God says, take off your filthy rags. But Lord, I've had that rag since 19 whatever, and I want to hold on to it. We want to hold our rags. And the Lord said, I can't put my breastplate of righteousness on you until you get rid of those rags. And that's a challenge. So we have to clean out our spiritual closet before we can wear this garment. And Isaiah 64, 6 says, All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We're all shriveled up like a leaf, and the wind, our sins sweep us away. So why is the breastplate so important? Well, think about where it is. It's over your heart. What is the first place the enemy wants to attack you? In your heart. Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart. Everything flows from the heart. So wouldn't that be one of the first places the enemy wants to attack you is in your heart? So how do we wear it? Well, I've just told you, we take off our own self-righteousness. We accept Jesus as our Savior and our salvation. We allow the Holy Spirit to be a watchman over our heart. And we walk upright in obedience, knowing that it's not okay to sin today and repent tomorrow and sin today and repent tomorrow. Why not? Because the one time you decide, oh, I'll just sin today and repent tomorrow. God is good. He's going to take care of it. That might be the one time that you take off your breastplate and the enemy attacks. We have to keep the breastplate of righteousness on 24-7. So that leads me to the gospel of the shoes of peace. And uh, now, men might not relate to this, but there's women in here, and you know, we all love some good shoe shopping, right? I mean, it's, it's therapy. Shoe shopping, it's therapy. But I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes shoe shopping is difficult. You know, the ones who look, the, the shoes that look good don't fit right, <laughs> or they don't have my size, or all those other things. But every girl, and some guys, they like a new pair of shoes. Footwear, though, is designed for a purpose, and so were we. We were designed for a purpose. You don't wear snow boots to the beach. You don't wear flip-flops to run a 5K race, but yet sometimes we think that we can get up in the morning and put on the wrong shoes and go run our spiritual race, and then we wonder why we're not getting anywhere. Well, we have the wrong shoes on. If we want to be warriors, we have to have the right pair of shoes. We need shoes that are designed for battle and shoes that are designed for to spread the gospel of Jesus and bring peace through that. The gospel of the shoes of peace are simply salvation, knowing Jesus Christ. He is the good news, and that's our purpose, is to spread that good news. These shoes keep us firmly grounded, and I'm telling you, y'all, in this world, you need something to keep you grounded because 
everything, everything is designed in this world to get you off course. And, you know, the, the, the soldiers had these little hobnails on the bottom of their shoes that kept them planted and firm. So when they went over uneven terrain and, and into difficult places, they didn't fall, but they would stand. We have to have stability in our spiritual walk. And these shoes of peace are none other than Jesus Christ who allows us to stand firmly. The shield of faith. This is one of my favorite pieces of armor because you know what? We have to pick it up. We have to pick it up. You can have a shield of faith, but if it's laying over there, it's not going to help you much. You have to pick up the shield of faith. The shield of faith requires action on our part. It requires us to do something. And Ephesians 6.16 says, In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the fiery flaming arrows of the evil one. So this is a good time to talk about fiery darts. And I never thought a whole lot about fiery darts before when I read about them in the Bible. I just thought, oh, those are those things that just come at you every day, you know. But no, they are fiery darts. They're not just darts. They're on fire. There's a, there's a whole other level to that when you think about fiery darts because back in the days of the Roman soldiers, their shields were made of wood for the most part. And the darts that were being fired at them were on fire. And if the dart happened to hit the wood and stick, it would catch the whole entire shield on fire. And it was meant to do that so that it would spread throughout the entire army. How many times have we let fiery darts be shot at ourselves and we didn't have our shield of faith ready? So what do I mean by getting it ready? Well, they would soak their their shields in water overnight so that when the fiery darts would hit them, they would be extinguished. That is what we have to do. God has given us a shield of faith, but we have to take the action to soak it in the truth and the living water, which is Jesus. And then we can stand against the fiery darts. It will extinguish them. Fiery darts are designed to go straight to the heart They're designed to distract us. They come at us from every direction. You ever had one of those days when everything is coming at you from 20? You don't even know which dart to, you know, put out. I mean, they're just coming from everywhere. Darts are designed to start fires, and those fires are things like pride, fear, and lies that spread among us through our families, our communities, and even our workplaces. They're designed to cause us to hide behind the shield and paralyze us with fear so that we cannot move. But the shield provides a covering of protection. And what's awesome about the shield is they are meant to be used in unison with other soldiers. And as Christians and as believers, the shield is that thing that allows us to join together with other believers. And when we all put up our shields and they form a barrier, we are stronger. The Roman soldiers knew. They they had this position called a turtle position where they put their... One of the uh, one line, uh, the front line would hold up the shield this way and the middle line would put them over their heads and then they had them on the sides and the back so they were protected from every direction. And that's what we are to do for each other, not just in our Christian walk, but in our workplace and everywhere else. We are to protect each other. And when we put our shields together and we work as a community, we are stronger. God knew that we would be stronger together. That's why he created us for community. When we link our shields together, we are protected. So, moving to the helmet of salvation. And this is where, boy, the enemy gets me here a lot. I don't know about you, but my mind is a battlefield. (laughs) Joyce Meyer wrote a book about it many years ago, but there's so much truth to that. Our mind is a battle. This is where we get confusion and chaos and and we get distracted and we begin that negative self-talk that spirals us down into a deep, dark pit that we can't get out of. And Ephesians six seventeen tells us, take the helmet of salvation. Our helmet is the hope that we have for eternal life through Jesus Christ. It tells us that we are more than conquerors, that it's our identity in Christ. It doesn't matter what the world says about me. The world does not define me. I'm not defined by my battles. My battles cannot defeat me because 
I am victorious through the hope I have in Jesus Christ. It protects my mind from the powerful and deadly blows of the enemy. It, it, where This is where evil thoughts take root. This is where things begin. Satan wants to control that, y'all. He wants to have dominion over it. He wants us to think we're not good enough, spiritual enough, loved enough. But if we claim our identity in Christ and we capture those negative thoughts and we send them away and we replace them with who we are in Christ, that we are more than conquerors, we are the head and not the tail, we are forgiven, we are friends of God and citizens of heaven, then Satan has to leave. He has to leave. You may have heard the old statement, garbage in, garbage out. We have to be careful what we're putting in our heads and our hearts each day. And we have to take on the mind of Christ. Romans 12, 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? Your mind. There is where you will be able to test and approve what is God's will, His good and pleasing and perfect will. And the Holy Spirit will give you discernment for that. Now I'm to the last piece of the uh, armor. And this is the only piece of the armor that is not a defensive piece. It's the only piece that is offensive. It's the only piece that you actually can pick up and use against the enemy. You don't wear it, you use it. And it's the, it's the truth and the word of God. It's different than the truth in the belt. It's different than the written word of God. It's the spoken word of God. It's the breathed, God-breathed word. It's that rhema word. And it's different because Satan knows the word of God, but he does not know the power. He does not have the power that's behind it, and he will use it against you. But our sword will give us the authority that we need. When we hold it in our hands, it gives us the offensive that we need but we have to know the word. We have to stay away from the lies of the enemy. We have to realize that Satan is going to twist and manipulate the words of God against us. And just like Jesus was tempted with the word, we have to give it right back at him with our sword. We have to be able to pray in the spirit. The prayer is what activates our sword. Praise is what activates our sword. Our testimony is what activates our sword. And the sword is what activates our weapon. When the enemy sees us in our spiritual armor, carrying our spiritual sword, he shakes in his boots. Make no mistake, he is afraid. So what is the opposite of the armor of God? Well, it's the armor of me. When I become self-indulgent, when I become self-sufficient, when I think that I can do all things through me instead of through Christ, I began to take off God's armor and I began to replace it with my own armor. And here's the problem about that. Because my carnal version of the armor of God is a counterfeit. It's a counterfeit power suit. In the fashion world, they call it a knockoff. And it may look good on the outside and you can fool a few people with it some of the time, but eventually it's going to fall apart and everybody's going to know what it really is. And this is kind of how I define my personal armor. Um, it's the belt of denial, the breastplate of excuses, the shoes of self-pity, a shield of perfectionism, a helmet of avoidance, and a sword of blame, which are totally opposite of what God intends us to wear every day. Friends, this imposter outfit, this armor of me, it will go out of style in no time at all, and it is not a good look on you, and it is not a good look on me, and it won't last. When it comes to dressing for spiritual success, it's really quite simple. We just need one outfit, and that's Jesus Christ. Thank you.